Our objectives are really simple. We want to set up routing and dynamic routing protocols with IPv6. So we're going to take a look at RIP, OSPF, and EIGRP across all three of these routers. I also have our hosts. I've got a Windows box living on this subnet and a Linux box over here. So after we get routing in place, we should have full connectivity between those two different network segments. So let's start off with R1, and we'll start off with RIP as well. With RIP, it's a little bit different than in IP version 4. In version 6, we enable RIP on individual interfaces by going into interface configuration mode. So to do that here on R1, we'll simply go to configuration mode, go to interface FA00, and we're going to simply tell the interface, hey, guess what? You get to play the game called RIP Next Generation, just like Star Trek. So one other little aspect here is that we're also going to give a name to the RIP process. You can call it anything you'd like, but that way when you enable RIP on this interface for a process called MyRIP, you can enable it on this interface for the same process. Think of it like a process number in OSPF, but with RIP is simply the name that identifies the process. And that's it. Then we do a show IPv6 protocols and verify that we got both of those interfaces. So the output of show IP protocols or show IPv6 protocols is a little bit different than show IP protocols in IPv4, but it gives us some of the basic information. RIP is running. We have our connected networks that we're routing for, and also we're routing for the process called MyRIP for RIP Next Generation. These, these are the interfaces that are included. Great, so let's head over to R2 and configure R2 with RIP. If you don't love RIP, that's okay. It works very similar to how it did back in IPv version 4. It sends updates every 30 seconds, sends the entire routing table, follows the rules of split horizon and poison reverse and triggered updates and all that cool stuff just like it did previously. So there you have it. Check it out. We've just enabled RIP on these two interfaces. And if we do a show IPv6 route for just the RIP learned routes, you'll notice that we've just learned about the 11 subnet or the 111 subnet. So that's R1 advertising it to R2. Take a look at the next hop too. With IP version 4, we only have one IP address to play with on an interface, but unless you're using secondary addresses. But with IPv6, we have our global addresses, but I want you to pay attention to what type of next hop address we're using. So R1 advertised the 111 subnet over to R2, and R2 says, great, I know how to reach it, and it's going to use R1's link local address to go ahead and reach that remote network of 111. So it didn't use the global address as the next stop, it used the link local. And that's true for most of our IGP protocols default behavior. So let's go and configure R3 as well. So if we go over to R3, make a little road trip, this is gonna be really quick. We simply enable the RIP process on each of its interfaces. Now we don't have to call it my RIP here, we could call it your RIP, as long as it's the same RIP process on both interfaces of R3, the name of the RIP process doesn't have to match from R3 to R2, from R2 to R1. And now we have two RIP learned routes. We know about the 111 network, which is over here, and we also know about the 12 network, which is right here. And that's RIP, next generation. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> also, you'll note here that uh, we have a, that's the administrative distance of RIP. They haven't changed it. Lower is better. So if I have two different routing protocols, both advertising the exact same network, the router is going to choose the one that has the lowest administrative distance. In this case, RIP is all we have, so that's the winner. Also, take a look at the hop count. It's, it's different than RIP version 1. Let's take a look at uh, R3. is a perfect place to be. R3 is saying, or learning, that to reach the 12 network, it can use this layer 3 link local address as the next hop forwarded out of FA01 to get there, and that the cost or the metric is two. All right, so let's go to the next routing protocol, and that is OSPF. With OSPF, it's done a little bit differently. I'll walk you through the pieces right now. Let's hop over to R1. And I was thinking about wiping out all the RIP. I thought to myself, eh, just leave it. Leave all the RIP configuration. It'll be fine because OSPF has a better administrative distance. So if all the exact same routes are advertised, only the OSPF routes will show up and the RIP routes will be suppressed in the background. Okay, so great. So let's go to R1, which we're at. And on R1, we'll go into configuration mode. And you'll notice that with RIP, 
we didn't use any network statements. And the same is true for OSPF and EIGRP. Network statements in router configuration mode are a thing of the past. But what is required on all the IGPs except for RIP, we require something called a router ID. And because I don't have an IP version 4 address on any of these routers, we have to hard code a router ID. Otherwise, it would give us a little message saying, warning, there's no router ID. I can't determine one because you have no IP version 4 addresses. So the router ID, it looks like an IP version 4 address, but it's really just a 32-bit number represented in dotted decimal. That's all it is. So I'm saying the router ID in router configuration mode on R1 to 1.1.1.1 right here so that's done and then i'm going to go to each interface and we'll simply enable ospf on each interface we'll set it to the process id it should be a part of and also what area the interface belongs to so on fa00 it's ospf process id 1 area 0 and on fa0 slash 1 is process id 1 area 0 as well so both of those interfaces are now participating in ospf version 3. OSPF version 2 is what we used with IP version 4. OSPF version 1 never made it off the, dra the drawing board back in the early days, not too long after ARPANET. So right here we have these two interfaces, and this router is wondering if he should become the designated router. And after he times out 40 seconds, he'll say, yep, I get to be designated router because there's no other routers running OSPF on these segments yet. So... That's the setup for IPv6 OSPF. Let's go ahead and do router two. So I'll we'll make a road trip over to router two and we can do a similar treatment there. I'll leave rip in place. We'll just go into global config, go into router config for IPv6 OSPF, set the router ID and then enable both interfaces, FA00 and FA01 for OSPF. And it's done, easy peasy. So our last stop is heading over to router three. So on R3, we'll simply plug in the OSPF configuration. We'll set the router ID and then we'll enable both interfaces and we're good to go. So from configuration mode, we go to IPv6 router configuration mode for OSPF process ID one, set the router ID and enable both interfaces on R3. And we should be set. And then we can do all the other similar commands like IP version four, like show IP v6 ospf interface brief or show ipv6 ospf neighbor show ipv6 route ospf all those same commands work just terrific so here we have our interfaces and because we are uh, not completely initialized yet it's showing wait for the fa00 where we're just making sure there's not another designated router out there somewhere and then here's our show ipv6 ospf neighbor we've got one neighbor and that is mr r2 and our routing table, hmm, our routing table shows nothing. Let's do that again. Show IPv6 route OSPF. And I just didn't give enough time to converge. I guess they were just exchanging routes previously. So here's the 12 subnet right here. And here's the 111 subnet up here. And we should have full reachability across. And we'll test with these two hosts in just a moment. The final portion of this is EIGRP. Also notice the administrative distance is 110, which is the case for OSPF. So let's finally go to EIGRP and we'll just overlay the EIGRP on top. Again, these are completely separate routing protocols. You can use just one everywhere and that would be great and probably most, more realistic. But here I just wanna show you that we could overlap them together and the routes with the best administrative distance are gonna be the ones that are used by the router and put in the routing table. Now this is very similar to the others. We're gonna configure the interfaces to enable them to be an EIGRP, but there's there's one little, and it's proprietary, right? EIGRP for version six, but there's one little pesky thing that comes up and I'd like to share that with you. And that is EIGRP, the routing process is shut down by default. So if we go to both interfaces and we enable EIGRP and I do a show IP EIGRP, IPv6 EIGRP neighbor, it says it's shut down. So you have to do two things. One, enable the interfaces, and then also make sure you do a no shutdown in the router process. 
So that guy right there brings EIGRP up. And just like OSPF, because we have no IP version 4 addresses on the box, we also need to set a router ID inside of EIGRP router configuration for IPv6. You'll also have to do the same thing for BGP, by the way. If you're running BGP and you have no IPv4 addresses, you'll need to manually set the router ID there as well. So why aren't we having any neighborships yet? <laughs> because we haven't configured R2 and R3 for EIGRP. So let's run over to R2 and do that configuration. So over here on R2, good. All right, we've got a, oh, that's for our OSPF version three. So let's go ahead and configure EIGRP. We'll set the router ID, we'll bring it out of shutdown, and we'll enable both interfaces, FA00 and FA0 slash one. And we should get the neighbor popping up with R1 right away, which it looks like we did from this message right here. And let's go configure R3 the same way. Once you've done this a few times, it becomes very uh, easy and natural. Uh, first couple times, first few times, um, because the syntax is a little different, you might have to practice it. So no shutdown, router ID, enable both interfaces for EAGRP autonomous system number one. And of course, just like EAGRP with IP version four, the autonomous system numbers need to match all the way across your EAGRP domain. Otherwise they won't uh, neighbor up and share routes. So here's our interfaces, our neighbors, our show IPv6 EAGRP neighbor. We could also do the show IPv6 EAGRP interface as well, verify which interfaces are participating. And here's our learned routes. There's the 12 network that we learned and here's the 111 subnet that we've learned as well. So that's all great. Let's verify this is actually working though, because that's the whole reason that we have this in place. We have routing in place so we can move traffic back and forth. So I have a couple of friends. I've got Mr. Windows XP, he's sleeping there. I'll wake him up. And Mr. Unix box, which, which wants me to put a passcode in. All right, so these are the little mini me versions of them. And these are clients, the Windows boxes on this subnet and the Linux boxes over here. They are using stateless auto configuration, which we've covered in a previous video. And they got a default gateway information from the router solicitation that they gave and the router advertisement that they got back from the router that gave them the prefix information as well as the default gateway to use, which was them. So. We should have full connectivity. Let's test. Let's bring this guy full screen. And that's that keystroke right there. And let's bring up the command prompt. And if we want to see the IPv6 information for this host, it would be IP config. I think that's one option. So IP, IP config gives you that info. If you don't have any IP version 4, however, on the box, it won't even give you this information. So another command we can use is IPv6 IF for interface information. And I also happen to know that this interface that's connecting to my network is interface number four. So I'm gonna just say IPv6 interface four, please show me the details. And here's all of its information. So I've got this global address right here, which has this wacky EUI64 format. I've also got this anonymous global address that we talked about previously that this XP box can use as it goes out to the internet and that way people can't lock him down to a specific host ID and he can change that periodically. But you'll notice that the subnet is 111. So we should be able to ping, I'm gonna minimize him back. We should be able to ping this Windows box who's on this subnet from this Linux box that's over here. So let's bring him a little bit bigger. I'll leave the diagram in place so we can see it. And let's go to system. And under system, we'll go to add, prep, let's go to administration and let's go to network tools. Because I really don't care too much about this guy's IP address in this subnet, as long as he has one. So <laughs> let's verify that he does have an IP address. It's interface Ethernet 1. And this says that sure enough, we are on subnet 333 based on that right there. And then we are using an EUI64 address. So let's do a ping from the PC over here to the PC over here, which is our Windows box. Now, just for sanity purposes, I, I cached that <laughs> the global address for the XP box because I didn't want to have to cut and paste it or I didn't want to have to type it in manually. 
So this IP address here is the IP address of this Windows box over here. The 2001 DB8 211128 blah 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 the guy we looked at a moment ago. So I'm gonna copy that. That won't way won't be a typing exercise. Go back to my tools here and simply do a right click and a paste. And we'll ping that guy five times. And it looks like it's working. Okay, so that's great news. So the packets are being routed from this subnet over here. If we wanted to verify the path, we could use traceroute. Traceroute works for IPv6, very similar to it did with IPv4. We'll paste in the IP address of the Windows box on the left and say trace. It's easier said than done. All right, so it's showing here, it's showing the hop, the first hop twice. And I don't, I don't know the reason for it showing the first hop of twice, but that's okay. And it's showing the first hop is R3. The last, the host ID basically matches the router ID. I hard coded the global addresses. So the first hop was R3, and then the next hop was R2, and then it went to R1. That's hop number three right here. And then the last destination, of course, was the actual Windows box that responded to us. So we're verifying our path through the network. So routing. In this video, we've covered routing with RIP, OSPF, and EIGRP. I hope you had a good time, and I appreciate your participation. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks, everybody.